What is counterfactual causation? Consider this predicament. Three friends are hurrying to catch a bus when one of them collapses to the ground in apparent cardiac arrest. He's not breathing. Call 911 for help. One friend calls 911, and the other starts cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, with compression plus rescue breathing, thinking that this versus compression only, provides a greater chance for her friend to survive and be admitted to the hospital. The two CPR methods are counterfactuals since the choice of using one excludes using the other. So having different likelihoods of admission to the hospital following CPR is a counterfactual causal concept. But this is only the concept of counterfactual causation. It may or may not be in accord with a relationship in unobservable and indescribable reality. And since the observable outcome is limited to whether or not the patient survives to be admitted to the hospital, there certainly is no way to observe whether the concept is true. In another case of cardiac arrest, a medical dispatcher receives a call from a witness seeking CPR advice. The dispatcher thinks there is no counterfactual causation in this case, that is, no difference in the likelihood of the life or death outcome depending on which method is used, compression only or compression plus breathing. Diagram 2 illustrates this concept. So... He flips a coin to determine which method to recommend. Compression only if heads, compression plus breathing if tails. The dispatcher assumes that the caller will most likely use the recommended method, having intended to recommend the method of CPR by chance rather than by his personal judgment. The dispatcher has created A counterfactual causal concept between getting heads or tails and the method of CPR to be recommended. Diagram 3 illustrates this. Ordinarily, we say that the choice of CPR method is not causally related to the flip of a coin, but that changed when the dispatcher used his intellect to link the recommended method of CPR to the chance occurrence of heads or tails. And while there is no way to observe whether the concept that he created is true in reality, we instinctively believe that it is. It's another matter as to whether or not survival is truly related to the coin flip. That would depend on whether or not the intention to recommend the CPR method that is linked to heads or tails has a counterfactual causal connection in reality with the life or death outcome. And as we have already said, no matter what we observe as the solitary outcome, there's no way to observe that relationship and no way to prove or disprove the concept of it. The dispatcher being of inquisitive mind, decided to test whether a small trial involving the next 20 cases would demonstrate the existence of counterfactual causation in at least one or more of them. Instead of flipping coins, he put 20 wooden peas numbered from 1 to 20 into a bowl, mixed them up thoroughly, and drew out 10 peas at random in this sequence. As calls for CPR advice arrived in order one after the other, he recommended compression only for the 10 cases whose order of occurrence corresponded to the numbers on the selected P's and compression plus breathing for the other 10 cases. For each case, there were four possibilities regarding hospitalization or death. Survived after compression only, survived after compression plus breathing, died after compression only, 
or died after compression plus breathing. So he kept track of the survivals and deaths of the sequential cases assigned CPR by either method. After these 20 outcomes had been confirmed, he found that five cases out of 10 in each recommended CPR group had survived for a total of 10 survivors admitted to the hospital and 10 deaths. The dispatcher reasonably concluded that these results provided no evidence for recommending one method over the other. Now let's put all the peas back in the bowl. We see the 10 green peas that identify the survivors and the 10 dark peas for those who died. When we draw out 10 of the 20 peas, it's much like running a lottery. Suppose that in this lottery, as 10 peas are drawn out of the bowl one at a time, all of them turn out to be green. Exactly how likely would this be? To calculate the likelihood, we first imagine the peas in a row, numbered in order from 1 to 20. Next, we multiply the successive proportions of green peas still in the bowl before each draw. 10 out of 20 times 9 out of 19 times 8 out of 18, and so on. Times 1 out of 11. The product comes to 1 out of 184,756 possible counterfactual results. Similarly, drawing 10 dark peas would have the same low likelihood. So, if chance alone were the only thing operating, getting all 10 survivors in one group and none in the other would have an incredibly low likelihood of 2 in 184,756. Other than the operation of chance, what could explain such an extremely unlikely survival advantage? The answer is in the very strong linkage that the dispatcher created by recommending the method of CPR according to the random drawing of peas. Simply drawing out 10 peas from the bowl certainly has no magical effect on survival. So, beyond a reasonable doubt, survival must be attributed to his recommendations. The dispatcher would indeed be justified in inferring the existence of a counterfactual causal relationship in one or more cases, maybe in all, survival would be more likely after recommending compression only instead of compression with rescue breathing. Remember that five cases in each group, compression only, compression plus breathing, had actually survived to hospital admission. So the dispatcher had no evidence favoring either CPR method. But the 10 survivors provided the dispatcher with an opportunity to perform a subsidiary test. The test makes use of routine measures of a patient's health status. When the patient is admitted to the emergency room, an attendant determines 12 measures, including blood pressure, blood lab values, heart rate, body temperature, and so forth. These measures are combined into an index called the Apache score. An index score can range from 13 best to 22 worst. So, to determine the health statuses of the 10 survivors at admission, the dispatcher examined their Apache scores. He discovered that the scores of all five survivors who had been recommended for compression only were lower than those of the five who had been recommended for compression plus breaths. By the same type of calculation as before, the likelihood of that happening by chance alone is 1 out of 252. Similarly, getting the five lowest scores in the other group also has a likelihood of 1 in 252. So, if chance alone were the only thing operating, 
getting all of the lowest five scores in one group and none in the other would have the very low likelihood of 2 in 252. This observed departure from expectations would create a strong doubt about the operation of chance alone. It is much more reasonable to infer that getting the five best Apache scores in the compression-only group resulted from the dispatcher's recommendations. The dispatcher was indeed justified in concluding that there existed one or more individual counterfactual causal relationships involving the survivor's health statuses. So, what message can we take from this fictional study? Let's be clear. The dispatcher's trial was much too simple and much too small to justify any general decision in favor of either CPR method. Whatever is inferred from the trial should be limited to apply only to the cases actually observed. With this in mind, recall that we began by asking, what is counterfactual causation? We started with a concept of it in the particular case of rescue CPR for cardiac arrest. And we took care to point out that the concept of counterfactual causation is not the same as what exists in reality. The concept may or may not be in accord with the unobservable and quite indescribable causal relationship to which it refers. We then discussed how the dispatcher linked the recommendation of CPR method to the chance flip of a coin. This linkage created a counterfactual causal concept of a relationship between heads or tails and an individual's chances of survival. But the life or death of just one case isn't enough evidence to prove causation. So the dispatcher devised a small clinical trial of 20 successive cases linking the recommendation of CPR method to the random drawing of peas from a bowl. This was done to see if counterfactual causation could be found to exist for at least some of those individual cases. The trial failed to do so in terms of the chances of survival, but it did succeed in demonstrating the existence of a subsidiary counterfactual causal relationship involving the Apache scores of the hospitalized survivors. Some may say that this small trial didn't achieve much, but we beg to differ. It produced an inference of the existence of at least one individual yet indescribable counterfactual causal relationship in the fabric of the unobservable part of the real world. Paradoxically, by delegating his will to a chance process, the dispatcher was able to prove causation beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, the type of randomization used by the dispatcher to arrive at that inference is by no means unique. In fact, the clinical literature is replete with larger and more complex but similarly randomized trials that, taken as a whole, imply the ubiquitous presence of individual counterfactual causal relationships in our lives. So, what is the value of being able to demonstrate that counterfactual causation really exists beyond a reasonable doubt? Its greatest value may lie in the innumerable life situations when uncertainty is dominant. This is when carefully designed randomized trials and documented formal inferences can inform and shape the more instinctive counterfactual causal concepts that regulate our ordinary behavior. I hope you enjoyed our presentation. What do you think about counterfactual causation? It's such a mysterious dimension, an aspect of reality that lies just beyond our senses. We'll be interested in your questions, critical comments, and in general what you have to say about all of this.